Yo, what's happening guys? GM Cody. Um, here again with another old school RPG review since it seems like you guys are digging them. Uh, I'm going to do more. So um, before we jump into today's review, I just wanted to talk a little bit uh, about some stuff. So one thing is, um, what have I been up to? Well, uh, mainly just work this week. I did not get any gaming in this weekend unfortunately and uh yeah that's something i really am missing really hardcore is uh, regular gaming um i really really miss face-to-face -face gaming and wish i could wish you know our group could get back on a regular schedule now this week was my fault because i had to work uh amongst some other things i had some family come in town but i just missed those days where it was just every week you know um it was a continuous game but nowadays you know adult life it doesn't it's hard for to get everybody together but yeah i'm really missing it uh the good news is i do have some other games that i'm actually playing in which is really cool um i don't often get to play anymore so all of a sudden i've gotten invited to play in a few games uh well two games actually i'm playing in bears are going to be playing in bears uh against the dark master campaign and um you guys uh, be sure to tune into that. I will post it in my community post when I will be playing in that. So it should be a lot of fun. And we got a good group lined up for that. Um, and I j got invited to play in a play by post um, AD&D first edition game, <laughs> which I haven't played in a play by post game in a while. I did run a uh, original D&D play by post game. Um, I want to say uh, a year ago and that went really well um, but back in the day I used to do a lot of play by post uh, games so so we just started that uh, today or yesterday actually and so uh, that's been uh, really fun getting back into play by post I re I've always really enjoyed that and so uh, yeah it's been a lot of that's been a lot of fun and then of course I've got the uh, Prowlers and Paragons game which um, all my players have not gotten back to me yet. They've all been busy, of course. One of them's out of country, just got back in country. He was on vacation. And um, <clears throat> the other ones are just busy. I think, yeah, everybody's busy with stuff. So, but we were thinking about starting at this weekend. I'm not exactly sure if that's going to happen. We'll see. Um, again, I got to hear from everybody to uh, for them to tell me what we're doing so but that's something to look forward to but i do really miss that face-to-face -face gaming um so i hope i hope my face-to-face -face group we can get back on track and doing that and um the other thing about that is uh i've been all of a sudden i have the itch to for fantasy again fantasy never seems to go away for me and so i know last time i said i was going to do a review of against the dark master and I definitely would like to. The problem is I feel really weird doing a review if I don't physically own the books. Um, I like to actually physically read the book before I um, review through a PDF. Uh, so I do have a PDF of Against the Dark Master. I've had it since it came out, and um, it's a really good game. But I'm not going to quite review that yet. But since uh, we've all been talking about Against the Dark Master, it got me thinking about Merp, which in turn got me thinking about Rollmaster. So I got all my old Rollmaster stuff off the shelves this week, and I've been having a lot of fun flipping through those, uh, rereading the rules for Rollmaster 2nd uh, Edition, and uh, making characters for it. Uh, I do that when I get bored sometimes. I just start making uh, characters, and that kind of helps me uh, familiarize myself with the system if it's new or if I just haven't played it in a while, uh, I'll make some characters for it. And um, generally, I just have fun making characters anyways. I've always done that. So past few days, that's what I've been doing. It's looking through Rollmaster. So I figured today we're going to review Rollmaster 2nd Edition. Now, Rollmaster is a bit of an infamous system, <laughs> okay? Uh, we'll get into that in just a second, but... I want to talk a little bit about my experience with Rollmaster. So my experience with Rollmaster is uh, I've been familiar with Rollmaster ever since I got into gaming in pretty much 
from the beginning, uh, which I started gaming in the mid '90s. So it wasn't too long after that I discovered Rollmaster in the game stores. Probably a year or two later, uh, and the version I picked up then was this, which is uh, Rollmaster Standard Edition, as uh, us Rollmaster players like to call it. Uh, this is what was out what was out at the time that I got into it. And I think it's this version really that makes Rollmaster infamous because this is probably the most complex version of Rollmaster um, and probably gives it more of the reputation f what you know everybody calls it chart master, which this one really did have a chart for everything. Um, I haven't played this version in a long time it's got to be at least 20 years since maybe not that long but probably probably around 20 years since i've played Rollmaster's standard edition um but it stuck with me uh always the ideas in Rollmaster were always really cool to me it's always been a game that fascinated me and then um right before covid happened um like everybody we, i was isolated at home uh, well, I guess after the pandemic happened, uh, we were all isolated at home and I started making new friends online and we started uh, talking about games and uh, the guys I was talking to regularly, they were all talking about Rollmaster and they were fans of Rollmaster um, and I was like, oh yeah, you know, I used to play Rollmaster and, you know, so I kind of wanted to get back into it again and they recommended I check out 2nd Edition. Now, I had never checked out 2nd Edition prior to that. So I went on eBay and uh, bought all the old, bought a bunch, not all of them, but a lot of the old uh, second edition Rollmaster stuff and started to collect it. Um, so I have a fair amount of second edition stuff. And uh, this is the first, these are the first printings of second edition. Um, so you can see that these were actually really pristine shape when I first got them, but I used to have cats and one of my cats, uh, got a hold of this one, <laughs> but it's still in good shape other than that. Uh, so all role master systems really break down to three books. Okay. So you have the character law and campaign law, which is all the rules for making characters. Okay. And then you have arms law. And Claw Law and Arms Law and Claw Law is the combat rules, all right, and all the combat charts. And then the third core book in every Rollmaster set is uh, Spell Law, okay, which obviously this is the rules for magic and all the spell list, all right. Uh, so my copies are the second edition, first edition, okay, so there were two versions of uh, second edition Rollmaster. There was the original box set and then there was a revised box set which is the red box set uh, I don't have the actual box set I just had the books from the box set and uh, also during that time they came out with several books called companions and I have companions one through four um, and essentially what these were were optional rules and uh, extra character classes more spells uh, just more options skills uh, alternate ways of doing things alternate rules and all that stuff. So I have several of those. And then I guess this would be a core book too, because it's almost essential, is uh, Creatures and Treasure, which is basically the monster manual. And like the title says, it has monsters and treasure inside. And I also have Creatures and Treasure uh, too. All right. So those are my Rollmaster second edition books. And that this is really what... Um, fired up my interest in Rollmaster again and wanting to play it again. Um, now there's been a bunch of different versions of Rollmaster and it's a little bit confusing if you're just getting into Rollmaster. Uh, so I'll briefly go over that in the history of Rollmaster. So when Rollmaster came out, whatever year that was in the early 80s, um, it's been around that long, it started off with just the Arms Law book. Okay, and the Arms Law book was not a, it was not a self-contained system. It was supposed to be just a add-on for essentially Dungeons and Dragons, but any fantasy role-playing system to enhance the combat. Uh, okay, 
So it had all the combat charts in it, the critical hit tables and all that stuff that Roll Masters uh, famous or infamous for. Uh, but it, yeah, essentially the the first the first uh, Roll Master book to come out was just meant to be a supplement to D and D uh, to make combat a little bit more realistic or gritty, I guess. Um, and then they came out with the actual Roll Master system. And then when Roll Master Second Edition rolled out um, in the mid '80s. They uh, they came out with the box set with the three books, and it became a self-contained system. Even though those books, too, mention and have conversions for D&D uh, and other types of fantasy role-playing games at the time. So uh, they still were kind of hanging on to that, that you could use you know a lot of these rules and tack them on to D&D or whatever game system you were using. Um, and then there was... The Rollmaster standard system, which took a lot of this, it, it was a very much a different beast. Uh, same core concepts as Rollmaster Second Edition, just a lot more complex, a lot more complexity. Uh, had a lot more layers to it. Uh, Rollmaster Second Edition could too, if you added on everything. You know, if you added on a lot of the companion rules, which again were, you know, all those, all that stuff was optional. But if you did add all that stuff on. It could get a little bit unwieldy and complex, uh, but standard edition was was very much was very complex. Uh, it had charts for every maneuver and every skill and just about, and uh, the rules were a lot more in depth than s the base second edition rules were. And that was the version I started with. So then there was uh, Rollmaster Fantasy Role Playing System, which was a revised edition uh, and completely different. It, it basically, you know, standard edition was big bloat. And the, I guess the idea, which I've only looked at briefly of the um, Rollmaster Fantasy Role Playing, whatever. So that would be Rollmaster 4th um, edition, I, I suppose. They slimmed it down a little bit and condensed it and added some things. And uh, it didn't really go over too well with most of the Rollmaster players. I think, you know, there were people that liked it and there were people that hated it. Uh, but overall, it just kind of was pretty flat, it seems like. And I don't have much experience with that one. And then in 2006, they did Rollmaster Classic. And Rollmaster Classic was, all it was, was a reprinting of second edition and cleaned up, better layout, and more organized, but it was 90, I would say probably 98%, 95 to 98% the s exact same rule set. It was almost verbatim. Uh, there were some differences in there, and they added a lot, they added some options in there from the companions, and they tweaked a little few things here and there and changed a few things, but pretty much 95% of it was straight up the second edition. And so, uh, that's the one I would probably recommend, and that's the one we're going to look at tonight, uh, only because it's a lot, it's going to be a lot easier to look uh, at the cleaned up version of the second edition rules over um, looking at my um, original second edition books. Uh, I don't have a clear, a real clean uh, scan of that one, so th it'd be a lot easier to just look at the Rollmaster Classic books, which I don't have a hard copy of Rollmaster Classic. And I think I'm going to remedy that soon. That's going to be on the top of my buy list, with a, along with Against the Dark Master. Those two are the ones that I really want right now. So uh, you can get those print on demand, drive through RPG. The books, you need the three core books, like I said, and I think they're $20 a piece. So $60 for all the rules is not too shabby of a deal, I think. That's basically the price of one D&D book if you bought it retail price. So... Uh, that's the version I would recommend, all right, if you're going to get into Rollmaster. Now, there is a new version out, uh, Rollmaster Unified, which is a totally new, cleaned up, very different system. Still, uh, essentially, it's a lot of the same components and moving parts of Rollmaster. Um, I don't, again, I have not looked at this one very much. I looked at it when the beta was around, which has been floating around forever. And uh, it did look interesting to me. It didn't really grab my attention, though. So I would like to get a copy of it and 
check it out and maybe we'll do a review of that too. But today we're looking at what I consider the quintessential version of Rollmaster, which is Rollmaster 2nd Edition or Rollmaster Classic, all right? Um, so just briefly before uh, we go into the review of Rollmaster 2nd Edition, this is going to be a long review. So I'm going to review all three of the core books in separate videos. Otherwise, we'd be here for many, many hours, okay? Uh, so we're just going to review what we're going to look at tonight is the character law. All right. And we're not going to create a character, at least for this video, even though I think it would be an interesting video to go through and show you how to make a Rollmaster second edition or Rollmaster classic, uh, character. We're not going to do that tonight, but we're just going to go through the character law and ex I'm going to explain some of the core concepts and making a character, what a character is made up of. And I might briefly mention, uh, some, some rules and stuff. Um, from the other books, but we're not going to look at those. We're going to look at those in separate videos, all right? Um, I also want to briefly touch on everybody. I think this is a big uh, misconception and some infamy that Rollmaster has that is unfair. Uh, and some people might disagree with me, but I don't think Rollmaster is as complex of a system as people make it out to be, all right? Uh, it's very much... Rollmaster Classic is what we're talking about here, all right? So Rollmaster 2nd Edition Classic. I don't think it's as complicated as everybody makes it out to be. Um, it does have the reputation of having a lot of charts, but it really doesn't have that many charts, okay? So the only charts you're using in Rollmaster, uh, now Rollmaster Classic, we're not talking about Rollmaster Standard or any other edition here is you have a you have two charts for making maneuvers which is actions moving and static and then you have combat charts now you have a chart for every type of weapon all right so really you're only using you know a handful you know a few charts there and the charts to me are not any slower than playing D&D &D, where you're you know you're rolling a die you're adding modifiers you know you're really only adding one step there maybe um, you're doing the same things you're doing in D and D, uh, but you're also getting a more granular, um, more granular results from using a chart. I've never had any problem with charts, and that could be uh, come from my experience playing war games and miniature games, where I just grew up looking at charts all the time. So I, I never had a problem with charts, and I don't understand why modern players have such a problem uh, with looking at charts. It, it doesn't bother me. And in fact, I think charts can add something to a game that you can't get um, from just, you know, rolling a straight up die and adding modifiers. Now, I understand that, you know, there's some people that just don't like that extra weight in the game. And if you don't, that's fine. You know, everybody's got their taste in games. But I do think it's a unfair statement to say that Rollmaster is unplayable and overly complicated and unnecessary. Um, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. Um, once you get it, it does have some aspects to it that are a little bit foreign to somebody, um, that's not, not used to it, but once you grasp it and once you actually start playing it, okay, I, it, I'm not going to lie to you. It does look intimidating if you were to buy the books and look at them and you see all this information, but once you, you know, learn the basics of the system and actually sit down and play it, it goes pretty smoothly once you figure it out. Um, so now, that's not to say it can't get complicated. Uh, if you start adding in a lot of the stuff from the companions and you start adding in, you know, a lot of the optional rules and things, then, yeah, it could probably get pretty cumbersome. But I don't think anybody does that. In fact, most people that I know, and I know quite a few people that are big Rollmaster fans, and, uh, you know, that's their regular game, most, most time game masters. Uh, I know quite a few of them. Uh, that run Rollmaster on a regular basis, and they all t they all run their games differently. And the funny part is, a lot of them um, use a lot less rules, and they house rule a lot of things. And Rollmaster is pretty easy to, to house rule too. And if there's something in Rollmaster that's too complicated for you, it's it's easy enough to find a, find a house rule to alter that thing you think is too complicated. All right. Um, and same with the charts. You can completely remove the charts altogether in Rollmaster if you really wanted to. There's rules in the Companions for combat and doing static and moving maneuvers without charts. And it's easy enough to, it's it basically just 
makes it into a D&D type game. Um, so, you know, it can be done. So I just wanted to get that out there that, um, you know, I think Rollmaster gets unfairly judged. I think it's a great game. I don't think it's a game for everybody, you know, to each their own. Uh, but I do think it's a great game, and it's a game I would like to uh, start running again. Uh, so I'm going to try to talk my face-to-face -face group into playing some Rollmaster, and we'll see how that goes. I don't know. Uh, my group is not one... My group does not like rules-heavy stuff. All right, they're pretty, you know, they're pretty, for the most part, pretty casual gamers. Um with with a couple exceptions in the group but uh so they don't like real rules heavy stuff but i don't think it's i think i could probably talk them into it we'll see <laughs> we'll see i think i would at least try to at least do a one shot with them and see if they enjoy it or not uh so without further ado let's look at rollmaster classic shall we all right so this is rollmaster classic like i was telling you before uh, what this is, is just a cleaned up version of Rollmaster 2nd Edition. And again, if you wanted to get into Rollmaster, this is the version I personally recommend. Uh, okay. So Rollmaster Classic, this is the character law. All right. This came out in uh, 2006, I believe. Um, pretty cool art in this book, actually. And, I mean, it varies. Some of it's better than others, but overall, pretty cool art. Um, where to begin? So the first thing I want to start with, and uh, where's all the bookmarks? Oh, there's no bookmarks in this PDF. Well, that's going to make things difficult. All right. So the first thing uh, about Rollmaster is it is a D100 percentile system. All right. So um, the basic mechanic of roll masters you're rolling a d100 it is a open-ended roll on both ends and what that means is if you roll a 96 to 100 you roll the dice again uh, also it can if you roll a 1 to a 5 you roll the dice again now if you roll a 96 to 100 you're adding a new result if you roll a 1 to 5 you're subtracting from the result okay so that's this concept, I, this game might be the first game to introduce that exploding dice concept. I'm pretty sure it was. Uh, and they call it open-ended rolls in this game. And the open, the thing to note about open-ended rolls is they can keep going. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that's pretty rare for that to happen multiple, multiple times. But it can just keep going and keep going. And uh, so you, you make a D100 open-ended roll. And you add modifiers. Okay. And then for a maneuver, which we're going to look at here in a little bit, you have static maneuvers and moving maneuvers. Static maneuvers, essentially, you're trying to beat 100 or better with some modifiers. And then a moving maneuver, you consult a chart based on the difficulty. And it gives you like a percentage of how much you succeeded at the moving maneuver uh, for the GM to interpret. Uh, or uh, it gives you like a failure or, you know, a success. All right. And it's up to the GM how they want to use that. I know some groups don't even use the moving maneuver table. They just do the, uh, you know, flat 100 or whatever uh, to, you know, for a success. But that's essentially how most things work in Rollmaster. Uh, combat works a little bit differently. And we'll look at combat probably in the more in the next video but it essentially works the same way you roll a d100 you compare it on a chart uh, you have armor ratings armor ratings go from 1 to 20 you compare it on a chart um, now that d100 is modified by your skill and weapons and you know other modifiers like any other game uh, you know flank attacks and range and all that good stuff you take your open-ended result you look at the armor rating, you cross-index it, and it tells you how much damage you deal. And it'll also tell you if uh, what kind of critical you score. Criticals are a big thing in this game. Uh, there is hit points, and you take damage from hit points. You don't roll for hit point damage for weapons. The chart just tells you how much damage you do. 
but more than likely, most characters, ah, sorry, got a little itchy nose there. Uh, most characters are going to die from a critical hit. And uh, we're not going to look at any critical tables this time around. We'll look at it when we look at um, the arms law. But essentially, that's uh, how combat works, okay? Oh, jeez. My nose has been stuffy all day. So, character creation. All right. And unfortunately, I don't have uh, bookmarks to quickly get where I want to go. Uh, this is kind of an overview of how you would create a character. And I think that would probably... Uh, I would like to skip ahead so we can actually look at the nuts and bolts of all this. Um, do, do, do. Okay, so we'll start. Where are the... Damn. This really sucks, guys. Let's see. Okay, we'll just start from the chapters it gives us, all right? So I would probably start with attributes, but we'll start with uh, professions. Okay, so professions is basically classes in D&D, okay? Now, they're a little bit different than D&D, okay? This is a skill-based system, all right? And so skills are a are determined by your your skill bonus is determined by how many ranks you put in a skill. It's also determined by, you know, modified by your uh, attributes. All right. So essentially what your profession or your class is, is determines, uh, any class can buy any skills, which we'll look at later when we get to skills. Uh, but essentially what your class is giving you is how expensive it is to buy certain skills. Okay. So yes, a fighter can buy magic, but they're never going to, it's going to be more expensive for them and they're never going to be as good at magic as a pure magic user. Okay, so that's kind of how it works uh, with professions. Now, the base professions in the core book are fighter, uh, thief, rogue, warrior, monk, uh, cleric, animist, healer. Uh, animist might be one that I have to like describe a little bit. That's pretty much kind of a druid. Okay, not quite, but kind of. Uh, a druid okay so healer uh magician which is your pure mage illusionist alchemist uh mentalist and essentially those are magic users that deal with um mental magic and mind control and stuff like that uh lay healer uh essentially a pure healing magic using class uh seer and then you have uh, combined magic users. These are called uh, hybrid magic users, okay? And they're not as good as a pure magic user. Uh, they get essentially like a pure magic user gets skills or, or spell list in one realm of magic, okay? And a hybrid magic user gets two realms of magic, but they can't get as high level as a pure magic user, all right? And there are different realms of magic, which we'll look at uh, when we get to the... Uh, spell law. Uh, but essentially, I just wanted to explain what that is. So these are the hybrid magic users. So you have sorcerer, and they use essence and channeling. You have mystic, and they use essence and mentalism. You have astrologer, and they use channeling and mentalism. And then you have combined arms and magic. Okay, and these are called uh, semi spell users. Uh, so they usually get one or two realms of magic. And uh, they're not nearly as strong, again, as, you know, uh, a semi or pure magic or uh, hybrid or pure magic user. So you have monks, um, you know, that is basically the D&D &D type of hand-to-hand -hand monk, but they also have uh, some magic of their own. Uh, rangers, same thing. It's pretty much the D&D &D ranger, and they have their own magic list. Uh, and bards, and they're pretty much the same as the D&D &D bard, okay? Uh, so yeah, that is the, and then they have the no profession profession, which is actually from one of the companions, but it's an option in, in Rollmaster Classic. That's essentially all the professions. 
Uh, in the Companions, they have a whole lot more professions. They have paladins, barbarians, and they have some weird stuff, astral travelers and bounty hunters and all kinds of things in the Companion books. Unfortunately, they've only reprinted the first Companion book, but it's not too hard to find uh, find the other Companion books hanging around if you wanted to, some of those options. You know what I mean? Uh, not too hard to find. Uh, so yeah, that's professions, races and cultures. Uh, you have humans, elves, dwarves, um, half elves, halflings, orcs, and trolls. Okay. And then, um, you have some, uh, what do you call it? Um, sub, you know, sub races of each of those races. You have common men, high men, uh, half elves, wood elves, high elves, fair elves, dwarves, halflings. Uh, lesser orcs, greater orcs, and trolls. Now, of course, the orcs and trolls are optional. They don't have half orcs and half trolls and stuff like that in here, though it wouldn't be too hard to say that, you know, just an orc could, would just be a half orc, right? Uh, there are rule again, there are rules for those, like, half orcs and stuff in one of the companion books. So... <clears throat> And essentially what the races give you is they give you a stat bonus. not They give you a bonus not to your actual stat number, but to your bonus, all right? They also give you bonuses to your um, resistance rolls, which are basically like saving throws. Uh, they This soul, soul Departed is, um, I'm pretty sure, like how many rounds after you're dead you have till your soul is completely gone and can't be resurrected if I'm if I'm remembering right uh, let me see here um, pretty sure how that's how, it, how that works um, it, it doesn't really matter it's not really that important but I'm pretty sure that's how it works uh, stat deterioration again I don't remember what that means where where is the explanation for all this stuff that's really where I wish I had bookmarks. Uh, this is a lot of stuff that doesn't commonly come in play. Okay, I don't, I don't know what that means off the top of my head, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, you also have how fast they recover, um, hit points, number of languages they start with, their hit dice type, which is important. Okay, so humans mostly start with the D10. And then um, some races have a D8 for hit points, and we'll talk about hit points later, how that works. They call them concussion hits. Uh, I still call them hit points. And then maximum number of hits, concussion hits, or hit points that they're, uh, they can obtain. All right. And that's a little bit like um, uh, the new Pathfinder, right? Uh, the new Pathfinder. And I've seen some other games do that uh, recently take that idea that your hit points is determined by what species or race you are. Uh, linguistics table, how many skill ranks you have in a language uh, determines how fluent you are in it. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, finally, we're to stats. Uh, so the way stats work, there are 10 stats. All right. Um, so let's look at them. Uh, where is the full list of stats? Okay, so here you go. So you have constitution, agility, self-discipline, memory, uh, reasoning, strength, quickness, presence, intuition, empathy, and that's it. Okay, so you have 10 stats. Uh, when you are rolling for your stats, you roll a D100. All right, roll D100 uh, 10 times and you place the stats where you want them. Now, if you roll a 20 or less, you re-roll it, okay? Usually, unless, you know, uh, you wanted to play really weak characters, but the, the game the game recommends uh, any stat under 20 should be re-rolled. And then um, you can also replace your primary stats for your profession with a 90, a straight-up 90, if you want, okay? So you're guaranteed to have a 90 in your um, your pre resequit are your, you know, your dominant stats for your class, all right? Your recommended stats or what have you. Uh, again, that could be changed by a GM. I've played in a game before where you don't get that guaranteed 90, but per the book, that's how it works. Okay, so then you would, what you would do after you roll and place your stats is you would roll stat potential. 
And what this is, is the maximum potential, <clears throat> excuse me, maximum potential that a stat could be raised to when you level up. So when you level up, you have a chance of increasing your stats. And this will tell you how high you can increase that stat. So what you do is you roll a D100. Uh, you check the range of your initial stat, cross-reference it. We've got our first chart here. <laughs> and then that'll tell you what your potential is for later on. Now, sometimes that might, your temporary stat might not change at all. Okay, because um, you might just be maxed out from the get-go. Um, <coughs> but most of your stats... <coughs> excuse me, most of your stats will have a higher potential for the most part, all right? But this could vary wildly depending on how well you roll. And then this is what I was talking about, the stat gain table. So when you gain a level, you subtract uh, the different difference between your temporary and potential stat. And whatever that difference is, you take that difference and look at it here, roll a D100, and then cross-reference, and it'll tell you how much you raise that stat up to if you can. Uh, first, you need to roll a D100, and I think if you roll a 1 to 5, the stat actually decreases by, or is it a, I, 1 to 5 or 1 to 10? I think I think it's 1 to 10, actually, and I'd have to, um, I'd have to look to remember. But regardless, um, you roll a D100. If you roll, I think it's a 10 or less, you subtract that much from your stat. You actually lose points. If you roll higher than that, you roll a D100 again and... Uh, refer to this chart and tell you how much you raise if you can raise your stat if you have higher potential in that stat okay uh, and then what you would do is look at the master stat table and this is going to tell you your bonuses your development points which are essentially skill points and your power points which are essentially your magic points so you would it's pretty self-explanatory you look at what your stat number is and then it still has the uh, bonuses here for D20 for D&D. &D. Um, you would look at your stat. You would get your bonus. And on your character sheet, it's going to have uh, your temporary bonus from your stat. Or your, yeah, your bonus from your stat. Your racial bonus, like we were talking about earlier. Your race is going to give you a bonus. And any other bonuses you may gain for whatever reason, magic or what have you. And then you total those bonuses, and that's your total uh, stat bonus that you add when you make a stat or skill roll, okay? The other thing you get out of stats is you get development points, all right? And there are, uh, let's see, where was I looking there? Uh, I'm in the race section. Hold on, hold on. The development stats, all right? So your development stats are one, two, three, four, five. All right, and those are constitution, agility, self-discipline, memory, and reasoning. So those five stats, uh, whatever that stat number is, gives you a certain amount of development points, and those are your skill points every level. All right, you total all those up, and that's how many skill points you get every level. Now, as your stats increase or decrease, you'll, when you level up, you might have more or you might have less. But at level zero and level one, um, that's how many skill points you get. And yes, there is considered is considered a level zero. And when you create a character, you actually get to spend skill points twice. This is something that's oft, often overlooked by new players. They don't realize that you go through two development stages. It was a little bit unclear in the original books. I think in this one, it's a little bit more clear. But yes, you do start off making your character at level zero, and then you also um, make you further get you further uh, spin points at level one too, and they call them I forget what they call them um, uh, apprenticeship stage and whatever you know. So, but you do actually you know make a character at level zero and level one. All right, if that makes sense. Uh, and it's a little bit confusing for new players, but basically you're you're leveling up once when you're making your character essentially. Okay, um, but that only applies to skills, really. Power points are your magic points, and so whatever your prime stat is in um, <clears throat> your magic using ability, depending on your profession, that determines how many power points you get. And there's a couple more ways to do this. There's some other options. 
Uh, there's one option where you can actually spend development points and power points are more of a skill. Okay. Um, there's a, there's anyways, there, there are, that's one option I remember off the top of my head, but there are a couple more options in the companions and probably in this book too, or in the spell law book. Uh, but the basic way to do it is you just look at the stat and it tells you how many power points you get per level. Uh, stat effects. This tells you what skills, what's, what, sk what stats affect what skills. Okay. Resistance roll table. This is what you roll uh, when you're making a saving throw. All right. So you look at the target level, the attack level. And um, there's some things that modify that, which we're not going to go too heavily into this time around. Um, but it, you, you'll modify, you'll look at the attack level, the target level, cross-reference that, that'll give you a number. And then that's modified by a few other things. And that's what you have to, to roll to, uh, make your save. Okay. Uh, background. Okay. So after you make your, which this is kind of skipping around or it's a little bit skipping the order that I would make a character in, but Background options. After you get done making a character, usually I do this last, you get background options. Uh, you get a certain amount of points based on what your race is. All right. Uh, so this is kind of a balanced thing. So, you know, men get a little bit or get a, the most uh, background options for the most part, common men at least. And then the more the demi human races get less. And what background options are is they give you extra things at character creation. So this can be bonuses to skills. Um, it can be a slight bonus to stats. Um, it can be special abilities, which is a random roll, and you get some special abilities. You could have, you know, great strength, or you could be a, a werewolf, or uh, you could have infravision or acute smell, or whatever. You gain some kind of unique special ability or trait. You could also spend those background points on special items. And so you could get a magical item or a master crafted item or an item that would help you casting spells. You can also spend your background points on wealth and you get more money and there is special status. Okay. And so if you wanted to be, you can't just say I'm of noble birth. You would actually have to spend background points on this. And, uh, you know, with, with your GM's permission, you could probably just pick one of these or he might make you roll. And some of these can be bad, too. This one's interesting because it has some bad ones on it, like cursed or impoverished or criminal. But, you know, there's some good ones. A lot of good ones. Most of them are good on here. You know, you have royal friend and a guild background and multicultural and animal friend and rich and charmed and et cetera, et cetera. And you, each one of these choices costs one background point and you can spend multiple background points on the same choices over and over. If you wanted to, uh, they recommend spreading them out a little bit, but you could, they also say you could stack them up on one thing, especially with like special items. You could have one special item that has two or three different, you know, things on it. Again, with the Game Master's uh, permission. Uh, so that's how background points work, essentially. And then skills, which is really the nitty-gritty bolts of Rollmaster. All right. So the way skills work, I'm going to go to the skill table first so we can look at this. And uh, let's see, how do I flip this around? Um, yes, there we go. All right. So this is the primary skill development table. All right. So these are the main skills, uh, which it's a little hard to, I don't quite like this one in the role master classic because it's a little hard, um, to decipher what some of these skills are offhand. Uh, but essentially what you have here is the main skills, there are secondary skills too, and there's a whole hell ho, whole hell of a lot of those if you use all the options of Rollmaster, but in the base book, it's pretty manageable. And it also recommends you can make up your own, but these are the um, basic skills, okay? Um, you have armor skills, what you have is soft le leather, rigid leather, chain, and plate. 
you have weapon skills. And uh, I'm actually going to look at my... I'm going to cheat because I can't quite remember. So we don't have to flip through. And I can just reference this. And the chart in actually this old book is a lot better, I think. Uh, there we go. So you have weapon skills. <clears throat> and these are one-handed edged, one-handed crushing, two-handed bows, thrown, and pole arms. Now, when you take a weapon skill, you have to take a specific weapon. But when you create your character, you uh, categorize... You, you rank those categories and that's your cost for that skill for the for the duration of your character if that makes sense okay so like uh, let's take the fighter for example so you can see the cost there's five rankings here you would take those five rankings and assign them to each of your weapon skills and that's how much it would cost for now on all right but you get to arrange them however you like it character creation but when you actually pick a weapon skill, you have to pick a specific weapon. All right. <clears throat> then you have general skills. These are climb, swimming, ride, uh, disarm traps, pick locks, stalk and hide, and perception. All right. You have uh, spells, which is spell list, and you spend s skill points to buy spell list. Uh, you have runes, which is pretty much what it says, you know, figuring out runes and wards and stuff. Uh, stabs and wands is using stabs and wands. Channeling is uh, actually directing. Um, you meditate and can um, give people magic points, essentially. Direct spells. Uh, that's using, like, fire bolts and lightning bolts and, <clears throat> and stuff like that. Okay. And uh, so you could actually up your skill and specialize in a very in a specific type of spell. Okay, so every again, this is like a weapon skill. Every time you take this skill, you specify what the skill is in. So uh, you know, if you take directed spells, um, you know, lightning bolt, it would be for lightning bolt, and you could specialize in lightning bolt. Okay. Uh, the other one is ambush, which is you know ambushing pretty self-explanatory right linguistics is languages uh adrenal moves this one again is a specialized skill and there's several skills attached to it and basically what these are is um let me look at the book here so i can give you a little bit more idea this is like feats of strength and feats of speed balance leaping and landing and stuff like that okay these are you know special maneuvers that you can do physical maneuvers that are uh, a little bit, you know, pushing yourself to the limits of just a regular, you know, maneuver, okay? And you can concentrate and uh, you can l do these in limited spurts, all right? Uh, adrenal defense is kind of the same thing, except it's just for defense. And if you're unarmored, this is more for like a, a monk or a magic user, right? Uh, martial arts is what it says, martial arts. And then uh, BD is body development. That's your hit points, all right? So you actually have to spend skill points to get hit, po hit points. <clears throat> and then the last one there, what is that one? Um, that is... Uh, oh, PowerPoint development. Right, right. So they do have that option in here where you can spend uh, skill points for PowerPoints, uh, which is probably how I would do it nowadays, just because... Um, the base system, you don't start off with many uh, PowerPoints from the get-go. So I, I feel like magic users need a little bit of a leg up from the beginning so they're not quite as weak, and this allows them to do that. All right, let me get a swig of my beer here. Mm. Ah, so good. It is 4th of July, after all. Happy birthday, America. Um, the way skills work, like we were talking about earlier, you have development points, all right? And those are your skill points. <clears throat> and so you have two stages at creating your character for spending skill points. Now, these are done separately. So you have your level zero stage and your level one stage. You do not combine them together. You do it separately. There's a reason for that. The reason for that is this. 
this is how skills work. So if you look at the skills here, we'll start with, um, we'll just look at a fighter, all right? And uh, we'll look at the climb skill. So if you look right here, uh, well, it's not going to work too good, highlighting. But if you look right there where my cursor is, you can see climb for a fighter. It says 3 7. So what that means is you can spend up to two ranks per a level, usually, if it has, a, okay, you, really the way it works is you, you can only increase the skill by one rank, usually, uh, per level. Now, if it has a slash after it, you can increase it two ranks. So the first number is to increase it one rank, that first rank per level. Now you can do something called, I forget what they call it, um, it um, rapid learning or something like that. Essentially, you get a second bonus skill rank per level, but it costs more, okay? Uh, usually double or sometimes triple the amount. Uh, so in this case, to get climb for a fighter, the first rank would be three points per level. And then if I wanted to get that second rank for a level, it would be seven points, okay? Uh, some skills you cannot take more than one level in. You can see here, like the Clara, for example, can only take one point of climb per level. Now, this is something that I do believe differs from the the old school second edition because most of these skills for everybody can be taken more than once. Uh, in the classic edition here, it seems like it's a little different. Uh, let's take a look here, actually, because I was just looking at this yesterday. No, it's it's about the same, actually. I'm sorry, it's about the same. So. If it doesn't have a slash after it, you know, you can, you and it's it's pretty much, I'd say 98% exactly the same. Uh, so if it doesn't have a slash after it, you can only take it um, one time. Now, if it has a slash and an asterisk after it, that means it can be taken as many times as you want per level. All right? And uh, usually this applies to spell list and um, linguistics and armor skills. All right, so let's get into some nitty gritty about how some of these skills work. So we'll start with armor skills. So you have to be, you do not have to be skilled in armor to use armor, but it helps because if you are not skilled in armor, you take penalties, all right? Now, obviously, it pretty much works the way you're thinking it works. If you're wearing lighter armor, it has a whole lot less penalty. If you're wearing heavier armor, it has a whole lot more penalty. Per, th per the base rules, um, most of the magic users cannot wear armor, with a few exceptions. Uh, but there are rules in spell law, optional rules, that give you penalties uh, for wearing armor, but magic users can still wear armor. Okay. Uh, so anybody can wear armor. It just, again, if you look at the professions, like a fighter, obviously the armor skills are the cheapest and, a, you know, a magician, it's really damn expensive, but he can still take skills in armor. And this is one of the cool things about role masters. You can take a little bit of this and that, and, uh, that's a little bit outside of your class. You know what I mean? You're not just completely specialized on one thing, which is a really... All right, especially at the time, probably, was a very novel idea. I, I'm not so sure that's so novel today, but it was a very novel thing. And it's still a very fun thing uh, in Rollmaster that you can kind of, um, and you have a lot of room to do so, you can kind of take a little bit this and that. You know, you could be a fighter that knows a few spells. You could be a magic user um, that has some athletic skills or is sort of good at weapons or whatever, you know, so... That's kind of interesting, but your again your your profession determines how expensive certain skills are, and also you know what spells are available to you. So that's basically how armor skills work. Uh, weapon skills don't really need much explanation. Uh, I pretty much explained that. Um, spell lists. This is something that does need an explanation, and we'll look at more at when we look at spell law. So the way uh, spell lists work. <clears throat> is if you, everybody's able to cast spells. Now there are certain lists that are available depending on what uh, magic using profession you are. Uh, and if you're not a magic using profession, you're really limited 
to what spells you can know, but you can still cast spells if you, you know, learn learn some spells. Okay. And the way it works is every skill point you put into a specific list, okay, you get a 5% chance of learning that spell list. All right. Now you can only uh, learn one spell list per level unless you just spend a flat out 20 points on it and automatically learn that list. All right. So... You know, for example, say you had 30 skill points. I'm just throwing out a number, which seems about average, actually. Uh, you spent 20 skill points um, to learn, you know, whatever the, the realm of light or whatever the hell. And uh, so you learn that list. It's 100% chance, you know, because 5% of a level. You learn that list. Now you have 10 more points to play around with. So you put five points in the realm of, you know, fire or whatever realms there are. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head. Um, so now you have a 25% chance to learn that spell list. So that's one way you can learn multiple spell lists per level, but you have to spend a lot of your time and skill points. A lot of your skills, a lot of your skill points would have to go into, you know, uh, one list. But if you don't automatically learn a list, you can only start to learn one list per level. After you spend all your skill points, whatever your total percentage is in that, you roll a D100. If it is equal to or less than the percentage, you learn the list, you check it off your character sheet, and you learn a certain amount of spells based on what uh, you've already learned. So we'll look at, again, we'll look at that more when we look at spell law, but basically pure magic users learn a whole lot more spells and can get to higher level than, you know, hybrid or semi or non-magic users. All right. And uh, you only learn a certain amount each time. So say you take the Realm of Fire, you, you'll learn maybe, you know, from level 1 to 10 in that list. But, you know, say you get to level 10, you want to learn the rest of the spells. Well, you have to devote more spell, uh, you have to devote more skill points into it to attempt to learn the rest of the list. All right? So that's essentially how that works. Um, linguistics doesn't really need much explanation. And uh, power points, you know, I already kind of explained that. Uh, body development, the way hit points work is you start off with a base number of hit points, <clears throat> which is, um, what is it? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Uh, hold on. Let's just, I can't remember off the top of my head right now. Um, do, do, do. Body development. Dang it. Hold on, guys. I'm sorry. I can't remember every rule. Uh, man, I am completely missing it. I'm like right in the skill section and just not seeing it. Should be special skills, linguistics. There it is right there. Body body development. So your base hit points, I, that's what I thought it was. I should have just said what my gut instinct was, right? Uh, it's constitution divided by 10, uh, rounded down, of course. <clears throat> so that's your base hit points for everybody. And then you buy uh, body development points. Um, every point you spend in body development, you get to roll a hit die. Okay, and your hit die is determined what race you are. Usually it's a D10 or a D8. All right, and that's how many hit points you add. And obviously, obviously, as you can see, you know, fighters, fighting type characters, it's a lot cheaper for them uh, to buy hit points or body development than other classes. All right, so that's how hit points work. But it is possible, you know, um, to a degree for, you know, a magic user if they... Well, probably not. It's probably not possible. It is possible that they could have higher hit point totals. But overall, if a, spider, if a fighter uh, spends his full potential, he's probably still going to get more hit points. All right, so that's how that works. Um, let's see. Let's flip this back around. Uh, I do not like whatever happened to this new Adobe Reader. I just turned it on today and it completely changed. I don't know if they did an update or if I did something weird. I don't know what's going on, but 
Uh, everything's changed on here. Okay, so anyways, maneuvering in armor. Uh, how long are we going here? We're going almost an hour. Okay. And we're, we don't have too much longer. So maneuvering our armor, we I already briefly talked about this. Whatever the armor type is, which is dependent on what kind of armor you're wearing, goes from 1 to 20, tells you what your minimal, you have minimal maneuver, maximal maneuver, missile attack penalty, and quickness penalty. Now this, uh, your maneuvering modifier can be modified by your skill rank in your armor. So if you want to wear heavy armor, you definitely want to take lots of skill points in the armor um, categories, right? Um, now, this is one thing I'm not a huge fan of in Rollmaster. It's probably my least favorite thing. I can see the reason for it. It's a balanced thing, but I think it's the least realistic thing in Rollmaster. And actually, funny enough, I've... Uh, I had a really good, and I've talked to him multiple times, is Coleman Charlton, who was one of the lead, if not the lead guy that designed Rollmaster, uh, second edition especially. He had a, uh, you know, he was way up in the company. He was also one of the lead game designers. And uh, he had a lot to do with Merp too, I believe. Uh, really cool dude. And he still plays Rollmaster to this day. He, he actually invited me to play in his games and, He's still always inviting me, and I just don't have time. I don't. I just need to take him up. And actually, we need to have him on the channel. Is what we need to do. It'd be really cool to talk to uh, talk to Coleman about these things. Uh, but it's pretty cool. He still plays with the, the same group he played with back then. A lot of those guys and gals he plays with are um, all ex Iron Crown uh, Enterprise employees, and they still have an ongoing uh, Merp slash Rollmaster campaign, and it sounds really awesome. Um, but this is one thing I actually talked to Coleman about because he was telling me that when him and Pete Finland and some of the other guys were uh, designing Rollmaster, uh, you know, they did a lot of historical research to make sure they got things right. Now, obviously, in the 1980s, historical research was good, but it's not it was not as strong as it is now. You know, it's. Like anything, you know, especially medieval and dark ages history, we've learned a whole hell lot more about these things as time has gone on. So I think the conception of armor um, has changed a lot. All right. And, you know, they were just going off the sources they had. Uh, so the thing I disagree with here is the reason I don't find this realistic is... <coughs> um, the armor, I don't have a problem with armor skills as such. That kind of makes sense to me to a degree. Uh, but the penalties for armor are rather high when you get into, you know, the best armors. And I don't, I think they're too high, okay? Um, and this is coming from somebody that's actually worn real armor. I've worn chain mail and plate mail and things. And they are heavy and they are cumbersome, but they're not as heavy and cumbersome as... Uh, most people think they are or make them out to be, and that's become more known now. I think most people know that, that you can maneuver in plate armor. You're not like this walking turtle, right? Uh, it is still heavy and cumbersome, and it impairs you, uh, but not to the degree that most people used to think because now we have a lot more experience uh, and a lot more on-hands research with these things. And it's and movies in Hollywood, um, you know, have not completely informed our education anymore. Now, I don't think they were in that was informing uh, Coleman and Pete here when they were designing Rollmaster, but I think that it was just the common conception in people's minds. And also, I think it was a balanced thing. Again, I think they were doing this more for game reasons. But this is one thing I kind of. Or not kind of. I really disagree with. I think the penalties are way extreme um, for armor. And I've messed around with this a bit. If I if I played, uh, which I do plan on running a Rollmaster game, I probably wouldn't alter this at all. Um, <clears throat> I would just keep it the way it is because it's just a game at the end of the day. It's not completely realistic regardless of what you do. Uh, so... It's fine. I just that's one one of the things in Rollmaster that I 
um, I do not think are very realistic, nor do I think it's um, um, that great. So, you know, one of my problems with it. All right, so weapon skills, we already kind of talked about. Um, there is a thing called similar weapons, uh, which is an option. And so what that is, if you, um, you know, if you have a one weapon skill, say you have a long sword. Well, you're also sort of good at short sword and broad sword and katanas and bastard swords and whatnot, because they're all kind of related, though they are different. Uh, this is actually something I do agree with. Okay. And I've had this argument with people that have not handled real swords or have not done, um, you know, I, I'm not an expert in swords and medieval arms and stuff, but I have studied them. And not only have I studied them, I've had hands-on real experience with them. Okay. So, and not in the SCA, uh, real, real historical fencing. Uh, even though I'm not an expert in it, I have been trained in it. I have done it and I have handled different weapons and I have, and I learned pretty quickly that there was a big difference in using different types of swords uh, even if even similar weapons are very different, even swords, you know, if you use a real long sword and you use, you know, an arming sword, it's a very different thing. Okay. And they're actually two different kind of skills you're using. They're using similar things, uh, but there is some, some extreme, and there can be some real extreme differences when you get into things like, you know, rapiers and a long sword. It's a completely different style of fighting. You're literally holding your body differently and doing different things. Uh, the footwork is similar a little bit, but yeah, it, it is very different. So, but there are some similarities between certain weapons. And I think I, I, this is one thing I agree with like in AD and D and I agree with it here in Rollmaster that yes, you should be taking specific weapon skills. Um, and, but if you are familiar with one type of weapon, you're probably sort of familiar with this type of weapon. And that's basically how that, what this system does. And again, I think you get half your bonus uh, rounded down. Okay. It's the way that works. Uh, you know, these are all the different rules for using skills. Uh, let's see. Just skip ahead a little bit. So secondary skills this is what I was talking about. These are other types of skills. Um, and let me flip this around so we can all see it. And not that way, not that way. There we go. <clears throat> and this is other stuff like acrobatics and acting and animal handling, leather working, different types of lore, you know, tracking streetwise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you see that some of these skills, and I didn't mention this in the, uh, the base skill list, uh, it tells you what stats you add to the skill bonus. Um, some of them have two stats. All these have two stats here. What that means is you add both bonuses together and divide it by two. All right. Now, uh, the way skill ranks work, I didn't talk about that. So skill ranks work like this. Um, the usually, I think it's from one to ten. Uh, hold on just a second. Let me look at a character sheet and I'll be able to tell you a little bit better. Um, sorry, hold on. Here, yes. Okay, so it's ranks 1 to 10, you get a plus 5 bonus. All right. 11 to 20, I believe, you get a plus 2 bonus. And then anything above that, you get a plus 1 bonus. So that's the way uh, skill ranks work. All right. And there probably is a limit to skill ranks, but I can't remember what that is, to be honest with you. Uh, it's probably... I don't know. I've never gotten to that point, so I couldn't tell you. But, you know, that is in here. Uh, let me get this flipped around where it should be. Damn, I hate that. Uh, equipment and commerce. Okay, so the coin system in Rollmaster is a little bit different. You have uh, six different types of coins. It starts at 10 pieces, copper piece, bronze piece, silver piece, gold piece, mithril piece. And it's generally a uh, 10 for 10 system, right? Just like D&D, &D, except for 
uh, silver pieces. Uh, no, it's the same thing. Uh, the only difference is mithril pieces, which is 100 gold pieces. But, you know, 10 iron pieces equals 10 silver. Or uh, t 10, 10. <laughs> uh, no, I'm sorry. Okay, so 10, uh, 10 iron pieces. Okay, iron pieces is the smallest. I'm sorry. 10 iron pieces equals 1 10 piece. 10 10 pieces equals a copper piece. 10 copper equals a bronze, etc., etc., etc. All right. Uh, the standard in Rollmaster is usually the silver piece. Okay, that's kind of the gold equivalent of D&D. &D. All right. Most things are going to be in brass or silver cost. Uh, there's a bunch of rules here for reselling and selling goods and stuff like that, and they don't have the same value. Uh, it gives you different values, which is really cool. And it also, you know, if you resell things that are the merchant or on the street, open market or legal market, it has all that stuff if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty of where things come from. It also has different costs about buying things. So if you buy it in uh, rural, a rural community, a town, or a city, they're going to have different costs, okay? And generally, you know, if, if you buy it in a rural community, it's going to be more expensive and in a city, it's going to be cheaper for the, for the most part. Uh, so here's all your general goods. Armor. Here's all your armor, and it gives you your armor type. Um, it tells you where that armor covers the area. You do have different things like arm greaves and leg greaves, which do matter. Same with helmets. They do matter uh, because if you take criticals in this, which we'll see in the next video maybe if I choose to do that um, that you know those things do have an advantage they don't add to your armor rating but they do give you a bonus when you take a critical so you know it'll it comes into play unlike you know in D&D &D for the most part um, what is this stuff this is base spell items so you can buy some you know rods and wands and stuff that um have some powers and whatnot, but I think this is more for making items for the most part. Food, lodgings, and services, transports, horses, and such. Uh, weapons. Uh, again, weapons don't have a damage value. Uh, though, you know, obviously certain weapons deal more damage. Um, that's reflected on what they're on their weapon chart. And uh, weapons do have a fumble range and a strength rating to wield that weapon. Uh, enchanted herbs, this is a really interesting thing in Rollmaster and really important uh, that new players overlook. So if you haven't played Rollmaster, this is something that you need to pay attention to when you're making a character, okay? Is herbs. And the, if you're even if you're being a game uh, first-time Game Master or Rollmaster, you need to... Um, look at this and remind players that this is an important thing because I will say Rollmaster can be a very deadly game. It's not a game where you want to quickly and often get into combat, or if you do, you need to be really well prepared. <laughs> uh, so what herbs do is it, it heals poisons and fractures and mends bones and heals burns and also you know stops bleeding, which is very important, and also heals hit points. And these things are very important because when you take criticals, you're going to take bleeding damage. Uh, you're going to take, you know, shatters and bone breakage, muscle tears. And, you know, as well as spells, you can also use herbs, which are not cheap, by the way, but still, you know, worth expending money on, uh, even if you do have spells. Uh, so you can take care of some of these problems. All right. So herbs, very useful and very cool, actually. Uh, and there's, you know, there's a there's other herbs in here that give you like um, allows you to breathe underwater, and gives you enhanced vision and stuff like that for you know for a really short for short periods of time, which is cool, <laughs> really cool. Enchanted breads, intoxicants, you know, drugs. 
which is awesome. Poisons and a whole list of them. And uh, experience advancing levels. So pretty much to gain a level. So you start off with 10,000 experience points uh, at level one because it's considered you gained a level sort of already. You have some experience. It's, it's kind of weird. Uh, but you start off with 10,000. And essentially from levels uh, one through six, you need 10,000, or I'm sorry, one through five, you need uh, 10,000 more experience points to level. And then from there, it doubles. You need 20,000 more from levels uh, six through um, 10. And then, from, and then I think it 10,000 more, so it's 30,000. Then you need 30,000 experience points, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's a lot to keep track of. Um, I would probably change this if I, when I run my Rollmaster game and just make smaller numbers, or I might just use an achievement system because I tend to do that more nowadays where I'm just like, all right, it's been like two or three sessions, you know, gain a level. Or I kind of like uh, what um, Bear was talking about, which is something I have kind of loosely done in my head. Is like if you're level one, going from level two, you need to have two sessions and you level up. And level uh, three, you know, you need three more sessions, you level up, st something like that. I think that's a really good way to handle it too. Or I might just lower the cost for experience points because counting up thousands, tens of thousands of experience points is no fun in my opinion. Now, the one thing I do think is cool for, for the time that this game was made was their experience points and how you gain them. You don't just gain experience points for killing things and getting gold. You also get experience points for, uh, like, every hit you deliver, what kind of criticals you do, coming up with cool ideas, uh, doing maneuvers and skills, uh, traveling, which Merp has that too, where you gain experience. And this is pretty much like the Merp thing, right? Uh, you gain experience points for traveling, uh, using spells, uh you interacting or with a deity or spiritual some you know spiritual beings uh and this one's weird you get you get one point for every gold piece worth of jewels which players destroyed uh and they give some reasoning behind that that the um the jewels have a particular spiritual na nature so interesting idea i don't know what i think of that but either way i this alternate kind of D, &D uh moving away from like the standard D, D experience point of rewards is interesting thing for the 1980s uh so you know we already kind of talked about going up a level so when you advance a level you get the stat gains okay then you do development points and uh, again, you just total up all your stat bonus, all your development stats, uh, development point bonus, again, and that could increase or decrease, like I was saying earlier. And then you buy more skills, and uh, finally you adjust all that, and that's that's it. So not too difficult. <clears throat> uh, let's see what else we got here. There is a thing, and this is something I probably wouldn't use or w wouldn't use anymore just because it's so, um, it's a lot to keep up with. Uh, I don't know, may, maybe you're not, but it's still kind of cool, is you get a bonus per level dependent on your profession to certain types of skills. All right, so like, obviously fighters get a bonus to, uh, high bonus to combat, and they get a little bit to body development and outdoor skills, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you get this every level. Uh, so it's kind of cool. Um, it is an option. In the base rules, this only applies to combats and spells. <clears throat> but there is an option where you can allow this bonus to all different types of skills. So kind of cool, but if I was playing, if I run a game here pretty soon, I would probably just do spells and combat, and leave the rest alone. And here's all the skill bonuses, and this is an uh, this is a another optional skill bonus chart that gets a little bo bit more, even more granular. Okay. Uh, 
okay, blah, blah, blah. What else we got here? Um, so this basically just goes into running a game and stuff like that. Um, this is important. This is the maneuver um, table we were talking about. So again, the way this works is, you know, the Game Master picks a difficulty, routine to absurd. You roll a D100, open-knitted roll, add your modifiers for your skill, cross-index that with the difficulty, and it'll give you a result. Now, if it's a number, that's how much you achieved in that maneuver, uh, if applicable for the most part. So like, for example, if you're climbing a wall, uh, you would, and you roll, you know, uh, 70, that means you climbed up 70% of the wall. And all this is up for the game master to interpret as they will, really. Uh, it does give you some guidelines for it. It gives you rules for it, but, you know, it really it's up to interpretation. And there's a lot of interpretation in this game, which I think is fine. Uh, there is bad things that can happen, you know. So, like, you know, the worst result is, you know, uh, fall crushes skull. Probably means you're dead, right? <laughs> Uh, now, this is something you would really, really have to blow on a really absurd roll, right? But it could happen. And you could also get critical uh, moves. Um, and I know some people don't even use this table at all. Uh, instead, they prefer just to use the uh, static maneuver rules, a little bit modified. So this is the static maneuvers. And you look at the categories and the difficulty, and it'll give you bonuses depending on the difficulties. Now, this is all up. This is really just a bunch of guidelines. <clears throat> you can interpret as you will. And essentially, you make an open-ended roll, and you're trying to get over a 100, and you succeed. Pretty easy. And uh, there is a action table for that that gives you um, that gives you results. So let me see if we can look at this. Because it is kind of cool. So like, um, you know, say you're picking a lock, you roll a 90, you get a partial success. So you don't succeed the whole way, but you succeed part of the way. And it says, you know, you can do it for uh, 10 minutes and you can try it again. So that's kind of cool. Uh, movement rates. It's based on your quickness, obviously, and it can be adjusted uh, for different things. There is exhaustion rules, and this is probably something I wouldn't use, but it is, it is interesting. You can gain exhaustion points, and it gives you penalties. Um, it's just a little bit too much to keep track of, I think. Again, you, you know, that's the way to approach Rollmaster is, you know, take what you want, leave out what you don't want. It's all a bunch of options, okay? be as complex as you want or you know maybe not as simple as you want it's still going to have some uh complexity to it but encumbrance you know there's encumbrance rules uh healing entries and death uh we were talking about you know there's different ways to heal there's first aid and medicine which are skills there's natural healing there's healing spells and there's healing herbs so there's a hell of a lot, whole lot of ways you can do healing, okay? And there's a lot of different types of injuries you have to, you know, take into account, which is interesting. And it's also interesting to note that, you know, because there's so many different types of injuries, um, there's different types of healing spells, okay? So you don't just have, you know, cure light wounds. You have men bones, <coughs> and you have, you know, men muscles, and all that sort of thing. And there's actually different schools of magic for all those. And some people don't like that. Um, there are options, I will say. There's options for everything in Rollmaster. <laughs> so there, there are some options in the Companions where you can take the critical hits out completely and just do a straight D&D &D hit point system. Um, so if you don't like the critical hits of Rollmaster, but you like something else about it, uh, whatever that may be, you know, you can take those things out. So that that is an option in the companions. Uh, diseases and poisons, which we're not going to get into too terribly much, but it gives you rules for all that stuff. 
Uh, there's a chart for non-player characters and appendixes, which is basically character sheets and all that good stuff. All right. Well, that pretty much wraps up uh, Rollmaster Classic or Second Edition Part 1, The Character Law. Uh, next time, maybe not next week, but maybe so. I haven't really decided yet. We will uh, take a look at Arms Law. Uh, for role master uh, and we will take a look at spell law and maybe we'll take a look at some of the other companions and creatures and treasure and I definitely want to take a look at merp and eventually when I get my hands on the book I just don't have the funds right now to just I, I, I really can't justify the purchase purchase right now but when I do get some available funds I'm going to be picking up against the dark master and we'll be doing a review of it but I thought it'd be cool to kind of start from the beginning of the source material and work our way up uh, to the newer, you know, versions, uh, you know, of the game. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this look at uh, Rollmaster. Uh, if tell me what you think of Rollmaster, actually, I know this is a very divisive game, but hopefully I can. I have enough experience with Rollmaster that I know the reality of Rollmaster. Okay. Uh, but let me think of let me know your experience with the game if you have any. Uh, let me know if you want me to continue with this series of making Rollmaster videos. I did notice that there's not a lot of people that make videos on Rollmaster, so I thought it'd be really cool to do one myself. Um, and yeah, just you know, let me know what you think in the comments. And uh, thanks, thanks everybody that uh, watches the videos. I really appreciate it. Remember to give me a thumbs up. If you uh, like the video, because that I don't really care about the algorithm and all that crap. I don't do this as a job or work. I do this for fun because I enjoy interacting with you guys and I enjoy doing this for myself. I enjoy talking about stuff I love. So hopefully you guys too do too. And it seems like you guys do. So I'll keep doing this. And I'm also trying to think of some other content to do. Uh, but for, you know, for now, we'll continue with these reviews. And uh, we might get back into doing the interviews and the podcasts and all that stuff. Again, we will be doing the uh, live stream. I'm not exactly sure when that will be starting here in the next few weeks. The minute I find out, I will post something in the community uh, on the channel. Uh, so you all, you know, you, all you guys will be notified when that's happening. Uh, but thanks again. And we'll see you next time. Y'all have a good one.